Today's scripture is taken from Habakkuk chapter 1 and chapter 2. Habakkuk chapter 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. O Lord, how long shall I cry for help, and you will not hear? Or cry to you, violence, and you will not save? Why do you make me see iniquity, and why do you idly look at wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. Strife and contention arise. So the law is paralyzed, and justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous, so justice goes forth perverted. Look among the nations, see. Wonder and be astounded. For I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if I told. For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation, who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up? Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? Chapter 2 And the Lord answered me, Write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Greetings. Now, if you enjoy listening to symphonies, you notice that generally they come in four movements. The first movement is typically fast-paced and sets the tone, sets the framework for the entire piece, right? And the second movement is alternatively slow and it's heavy, it's uh, more solemn and to enable for more uh, emotional lingering. And then, of course, after the, after the second movement, the speed will start to pick up all right, and in a third movement, movement, it enters into a dance pace to prepare the audience for renewed activity. And finally, the fourth movement returns to an assertive, triumphant, and uh, it brings resolution to the entire symphony, and the audience can rejoice in the finale with rounds of applause. So that's how a symphony typically uses four movements to take the audience on an emotionally dynamic journey to reach the finale with assertiveness and punch. Now, of course, there are no fixed rules as to the number of movements that a symphony could have. And some do come with three, five, or even more movements as well. So our book today reads pretty much like a symphony, and it goes through something like five movements. And these five movements sit on a dialogue between the prophet Habakkuk and God. So our dialogue today flows as such. Habakkuk laments with hasty, fast-paced angst unto God, chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. And then God replies with strong alternatives, verses 5 to 11. And then Habakkuk retorts with speedy apprehension, verses 12 to to chapter 2, verse 1. And finally, God responds in the affirmative in verses 2 to 30 in chapter 2. And the fifth movement is where Habakkuk finally uh, concedes with acceptance in chapter 3. And of course, chapter 3 is Habakkuk's prayer and declaration of faith in the Lord. So this is the Habakkuk symphony. And just like all other symphonies, the Habakkuk Symphony takes us on a journey as well. A journey that moves through chaos, that moves through disbelief, a journey that disrupts some fixed ideas about God. But it's also a journey that eventually finds resolution in faith alone. So our learning for today is to focus on the fourth movement, where God's affirmation is our fourth movement in the Habakkuk Symphony, and we'll come to that in a while. So two things for us today. WrestleMania and the Tablet of Promise. Now, George Merler 
who's an evangelist and missionary, once said this, the beginning of anxiety is the end of faith, and the beginning of true faith is the end of anxiety. Now, we find Habakkuk in the anxiety department in the opening verses of the book, the first movement of the Habakkuk symphony. So this man, all right, this man is full of angst, okay, and his faith in God seems to be challenged. The man is wrestling with God because he cannot tolerate the things that are around him. But what's happening? You see, there's chaos in his own backyard. Not the backyard in his own home, but literally the backyard of the nation of Israel, Judah to be more exact. Now imagine stepping out of your house, all right, and all you see are chaos in the streets. You see chaos in the marketplaces, you see chaos in the justice courts, you see chaos in families, and you see chaos at every level of society. Chaos in the day and chaos in the evening. And more than that, all right, more than that, chaos that does not stop but continues on and on and on. So the fabric of society is broken. So morality has long gone to the dogs and injustice rules instead. And idolatry has replaced true worship and suffering, strife, wickedness and violence and destruction is a daily occurrence. Now, doesn't this sound like some countries that we know today? But for Judah, this should not be. For the people of God, this should not be. This is unacceptable. This is atrocious. This is heinously sinful. So no wonder the man Habakkuk is angry and agitated. Because when you look at chapter 1, verses 2 to 4, Whatever that Habakkuk is saying was not the very first time that he has lamented to God about what's happening in his own backyard. God, how long do you want me to call out to you? Are you even listening? Your people are doing terrible things. You're not going to stop them? Why are you torturing me? to see all these violence and injustices and wicked destructions day in and day out. Aren't you going to do something? And look, God, nobody obeys you anymore. Nobody cares about your laws, your commands at all. There are no human rights. Injustice has gone to the dogs. Evil triumphs. How long more? How long? How long? Now, we can see Habakkuk's very pathetic. Evil must have been totally pervasive for a really long time. And it's amazing how he could pack everything into three verses for us. But such a scene should not surprise us because it happens many times in the Bible. For example, Psalm 13. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Psalm 89. O Lord God of hosts, how long will you be angry with your people's prayers? And not just in the Psalms, but in many other books of the Bible as well, the people of God wrestle with God for answers. They wrestle with God with their pleadings and wrestle with God for deliverance, for resolution of evil, for restoration of justice. Just look at Job, look at David, Jeremiah, and Isaiah. So for us as well, when crisis comes, when chaos comes, we too ask, how long, O Lord? When crisis comes, don't the people of God yearn for God to act? How long will you be silent, O Lord? Rise up and act. And so we wrestle and we wrestle and we wrestle with God in prayer. But you know the truth is, wrestling says so much more about God than it does about us. Now, for sure, wrestling can say a lot about us, that we humble ourselves to wait on the Lord, uh, that we desire justice and mercy, that we recognize our inability while we recognize God's abilities. But wrestling says so much more about God. You see, God wants us to call out and wrestle with Him. 
Psalm 50, call upon me in the day of trouble and I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. Jeremiah 33, call to me and I will answer you. God invites us to wrestle with him because God hears those who call out to him. Psalm 34, when the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them. Psalm 145, he fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He hears their cry and saves them. And then when we get more and more desperate, more and more angsty, and we wrestle more and more with God because we feel like he's blind and deaf and silent to all the evil and injustices and wickedness and suffering for a long time, my friends, God is really showing forbearance and patience to sinners all the while. Isaiah 48, For my name's sake, I defer my anger. For the sake of my praise, I restrain it for you, that I may not cut you off. And Jonah 4, Should I not pity Nineveh, that great city? So I defer with George Muller here. The beginning of anxiety need not be the end of faith if we take our anxieties to God and we wrestle with Him until we learn something from Him. We can and we must keep faith even in our wrestling. But the question remains, what do we do when God doesn't behave the way that we expect Him after all the wrestling? What if God's answers seem to conflict with our understanding of His character? Well, that's how it was in the second movement of Habakkuk. God replies Habakkuk with some strong alternatives, playing on the very same word that Habakkuk had used. If you look at the text, since Habakkuk questioned God, why do you make me look at all this chaos? God also tells Habakkuk in chapter 1, verse 5, look, look, bro, like really, really look. And observe with amazement and wonder at what I'm going to do. Because I'm going to do something that's totally stunning and unbelievable. Look this way, brother. Now, it's mentioned that the chaos that Habakkuk sees is happening within Judah. And Habakkuk lives in a time where the ruling Israelite king is evil. Evil is rampant. Idolatry is rampant. And all kinds of heinous sins were committed all right, by God's people. Authentic worship is at an all-time low, and there's zero fear of God. It's as best as it could get. And all that Habakkuk wanted was just to see justice done, right? Like, come on, God. Won't you just come and do the right thing for your people? But God's reply was far from comforting or assuring now, if you read the text, what God's going to do is something like how we would say in Mandarin, yi du gong du, using poison to combat poison. So what better way to remove Judah's toxins than to send toxic Babylon to do the job, right? So Habakkuk chapter 1, verses 6 to 7, 9, and 11 says, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that fierce and impetuous people. They are dreaded and feared, and all of them come for violence. They will sweep through like the wind and pass on. Now for us today, we may not really feel the, the magnitude of God's intention here, but to Habakkuk or to any righteous, God-fearing Israelite, God's words are beyond shocking. God's words would sound like, what? God, you're using a totally pagan, a thoroughly sinful, a ruthlessly violent nation to judge Israel for her sins? You know, it's like asking God a very difficult question. It's like asking God to, to get a hardcore criminal to judge a petty thief. So can you see the massive irony and the scorn that God is doing to Israel here? Now, of course, that's not an alternative that Habakkuk could handle. 
All right, God's punishment is too excessive. And using a greater dilemma to settle and answer a smaller dilemma, how could a pure and holy God answer violence with more violence? It's not possible. And especially violence from their worst enemies. Wouldn't that make things even worse? And so Habakkuk questions God in chapter 1, verse 13. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot remain silent when the wicked swallows up the men, cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? God, how could you use the wicked Babylonians to judge us righteous Israel? And so Habakkuk had to wrestle with God once again, which brings the Habakkuk symphony into its third movement. It's Habakkuk's apprehension of God's plans. Now remember, earlier I said that wrestling speaks much more about God than about us. So can God's unbelievable response to Habakkuk here reveal anything about him? Certainly. It was told that in the British Museum in London, there was an old maritime map on display. The map was drawn in the year 1525 and it outlines the North American coastline and the adjacent waters. Since it's the year 1525, there were many unexplored, unmarked regions on the map. And the cartographer who drew the map, therefore, wrote some inscriptions over those unknown, unmarked, unexplored areas. So on one unmarked region, he wrote, Here are giants. On another unmarked region, he wrote, here are fiery scorpions. On yet another unknown region, he wrote, here are dragons. And accordingly, this map eventually came into the possession of a British explorer named Sir John Franklin in the early 1800s. And it was told that Sir John Franklin scratched out all these inscriptions and he wrote these words across the map, here is God. Here is God. Now we got to let this sink in, my friends. Our understanding of God begins with knowing and believing that God is creator, right? That God is good and compassionate. That God hates evil and sin. And it's all in the book of Genesis. And God has a grip on everything because he is creator of the universe. When God doesn't behave the way that we expect Him to, when God's answers seem to conflict with what we think we know about God, when the more we pray, the more absurd and chaotic our situation appears to be, when the more we cry out to God, the more scorn and insults we receive from our enemies, when the more we sit in ashes before God and the more ruthless God's silence becomes and we absolutely do not know what's worse, whether it's the existing chaos uh, or God's ruthless silence and finding ourselves into unknown chaotic territories, you've got to believe that there is God. You've got to believe that it's because He is creator that He'll take time to fix things around us, however long it takes. And God can do the most incredulous, absurd things because He's God and you're not. Now to recap, all right, when chaos surrounds you, you wrestle with God in prayer, but you don't lose faith. And if God gives answers, but His answers crush everything that you think you know about God, and he's left you in the wilderness with the scorpions and the giants and the dragons and the sand in your eyes. Continue to wrestle with God in prayer and don't lose faith. Because God is there in the most weird, the most unimaginable, the most ruthless, the most unknown, the most chaotic and unthinkable of situations when ruthlessly unimaginable chaos is simply in your face, there is God. 
So you've got to hang on and you've got to walk by faith and not by sight. Now back to our text. So despite the unbelievable, unorthodox behavior of God in using the Babylonians to judge his own people, and despite Habakkuk's persistent questions, God replies Habakkuk one more time in order to remove all human doubt, in order to remove Habakkuk's doubt by commanding him to inscribe on stone all that he's going to do. And this is our fourth movement in the Habakkuk Symphony, God's Affirmation. Now listen to what God says in chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets, so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time, it hastens to the end, it will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him, but the righteous shall live by his faith. God commands Habakkuk to write the vision and to write the vision clearly so it's plain for all to see and to wait for the vision that will surely be fulfilled in due time, like literally engraved in stone. But my friends, God delivers more than just a stony witness as proof of His sovereignty, as proof of the veracity and the certainty of His prophecy. God delivers His promise to Habakkuk as well. You see, judgment on Judah by means of the Babylonian invasion and exile will come for sure. The ruthless, violent, Sinful and proud Babylonians whose souls are puffed up with arrogance, they will come to attack Judah. But for those whose heart is fixed on God, for those who walk righteously in the Lord, for those who trust and believe that God has a grip on everything, even amidst the most ruthlessly impossible and chaotic events on earth, they will live by their faith. Faith in a God who is just, who deals justly with good justice and in good time. And as they walk by faith, so will they live by faith. And by faith, they will find deliverance and life instead of death. But what's so crucial about this fourth movement, this affirmation from God? You see, God's reply to Habakkuk in chapter 2 presents several important dimensions that help us to look at the problem of theodicy, meaning questioning the existence and the presence of God in the midst of human suffering and evil. And it also helps us to look at the problem of God's sovereignty over human affairs in the world. And these two dimensions are covenantal dimension and kingdom dimension covenantal dimension and kingdom dimension. Now, firstly, covenantal dimension. Habakkuk gives us this timely reminder of staying in right relationship with God in the midst of spiritual decline and social decadence. Habakkuk gives us this timely reminder, timeless reminder of staying in right relationship with God in the midst of spiritual decline and social decadence. We are called to do one thing, and that is to trust God by faith and to remain in faithfulness, to trust in the God who is creator, deliverer, kingdom builder, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. It's a trust in the outworking of God's plans and decrees that will be accomplished through Christ unto the end of the age. Now, in fact, this line in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4, was picked up in the New Testament as well. Paul writes in Romans 1.17 and again in Galatians 3, the righteous shall live by faith. And this was reiterated in Hebrews 10, but my righteous one shall live by faith. We are of those who have faith, and preserve their souls. My friends, to live and to walk by faith means we must interpret our world 
in the light of the gospel. To live and walk by faith means we must interpret our world in the light of the gospel. The gospel of Christ is the only lens through which we can look at evil around us in the world and discern its outcome today. And that discernment is the wisdom to know that nothing we can do to reverse and reverse the decline and decadence in this world because Christ is the only overcomer, only the saving atonement of Christ, only the transform transformational power of the Word of God and the sealing power of the Holy Spirit could do that. He alone will bring a just outcome to evil in this world. So the book of Habakkuk truly crosses all time. It assures the Old Testament faithful covenantal people, both before and after the exile, of God's promise to act to bring justice and judgment to right all wrongs in their world. And then it also assures Paul's Jewish and Gentile covenantal people in their turbulent New Testament context of God's sovereignty and God's kingdom work. And all the more, the book of Habakkuk assures the covenantal people of God today in the rising wake of more and greater ruthlessly unimaginable chaos to come. Remind us of God's faithfulness, mercy, and love. So we should be able to say, as Habakkuk had said in chapter 3, verses 17 to 18, though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fail, and the fields yield no food, the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Now, the second dimension in Habakkuk that helps us to look at theodicy and God's sovereignty is the kingdom dimension. Now, we know that a right relationship with God is a dynamic relationship of knowing God's word, of putting faith and relying on God's wisdom that are found in His work so that we can navigate life in God's kingdom, right? And that's very essential. You see, God's law was given to Israel, and His law makes them to be a nation that is different from all other nations, that they be a wise people, a godly people, because her system of ethics and justice is different. Deuteronomy 4. See, I have taught you statutes and rules. Keep them and do them, for they will be your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples, who when they hear of all these statutes will say, surely, this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Now, if you go back and read the text, you can see that it was rejection and forsaking of God's law that the Judah that we hear in chapter 1 is in decline, is in chaos, as witnessed by Habakkuk. But God's affirmation and promise in chapter 2 remind us yet again that God can accomplish his kingdom purposes through sinful humanity and through the free will actions of his enemies. For example, consider God working through the events that surrounded Joseph, which eventually progressed into Israel's exodus. If you remember, Joseph kept faith despite all the evils surrounding and happening to him. And yet the progressions in Joseph's life were all kingdom purposes that paved the way for Christ, the new covenant, ultimately. Now, as I invite the pianist to play softly, I want us to consider these things. And my friends, there is real urgency in the book of Habakkuk. The appointed time and judgment of the Lord is coming. We are told to wait for it in faith. Chapter 2, verse 4. It will surely come. The Lord will not delay. In the midst of decline, in the midst of decadence, He calls all nations and tribes to call upon Him so that they can be righteous and live by faith because God 
is a compassionate and merciful God. And then we are told to wait for it in faith because no amount of evil and chaos can stop God's work to fill the earth with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. And we are told to wait for it in faith because the Lord is in His holy temple. He has spoken and all the earth will keep silence before Him. Chapter 2, verse 20. God alone is sovereign and in full control. And as we wait in faith, we may wrestle with God in prayer and God uses our wrestling for our soul searching. Remember, He invited Peter to wrestle with Him. The Peter who denied Christ three times by asking him, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me, Peter? And he invites Job to wrestle with him, the Job who pushes his rights and demands into God's face by asking him, Where were you, Job, when I laid the foundations of the earth? Have you entered into the sea? Have you walked in the deep? Can you send forth lightnings? Can you feed the lion? Was it by you that the hawk and the eagle soar in the sky and make their nest in the mountain? Answer me if you can. And my friends, think of occasions that you were wrestling with God. Were you crying out to God or was God inviting you to wrestle with your complacency, to wrestle with your lethargy, to wrestle with your pride, your ignorance, your anger, your lust, your self-righteousness? Or were you about to fall off the edge of faith and was God inviting you to purely wrestle with your faith and your doubts in Him? Remember that God will hear the prayers of the righteous. As long as Christ has not returned, God will forbear and give sinners time for repentance. And God's covenantal and kingdom purposes will work according to His time and not our time. And God is always on time. So think of faith as a living organism, not a static entity. All right, make it grow, invest in it. Then waiting on the Lord becomes joyful rather than painful. Because someone had said that I'm the tortoise in the race, but I'm a joyful tortoise. So if you are walking in the Lord, upholding righteousness like Habakkuk and are grieved with so much evil and pain and suffering surrounding you, or if you are like Paul, grieved with the body of sin, you wrestle on and on and on and on in prayer. WrestleMania will continue as long as we are children of the promise. Covenantal people of God yearn for the fullness of God's kingdom to be fulfilled. So let's fix our eyes on Christ and walk not by sight, not by feelings, but by faith until we see Christ face to face. Let us pray. Merciful God and Father of life, the day of the Lord draws nearer and nearer. And evil continues its course, but your Son, Jesus Christ, has broken its power. Though evil torments us, nothing can separate us from you. No principalities or power, no death, no angel, no height, no depth, no creature will separate us from you. Help us to walk by faith and not by sight. Glory be unto the Lord Most High. Amen.